Hello, everyone. Uh, there we go. We're on. OK, my name's Dan Berg, and I'm here with Rom Venom. Uh, we are with IBM, IBM Cloud. Uh, we're also members of the Istio uh, project. Uh, we're part of the steering committee as well as the TOC itself. And what we want to do is we want to take you through some information about Istio and multi-cluster service mesh patterns. Um, so this is something that was introduced in the 1.1 in the release of Istio. And we're going to take you through some of those patterns and give you um, pros and cons of each one, uh, as well as describe a real-world scenario in which uh, we've got a set of customers or a customer that's looking at adopting Istio for their specific application in the cloud. Is that not working? OK, you're clicking for me. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Clicker. OK, first off, uh, how many people are deploying clusters today, Kubernetes clusters? Every hand doesn't go up. All right, that's <laughs> awesome. How many people have more than one cluster? OK, everybody does, because everybody does. Um, you have to have multiple clusters. At the very least, you have multiple clusters for dev, test, and production, right? Your CI, CD process. In the room just before this was a panel about GitOps. You're not going to deliver code directly to production without going through some development and testing stage. I don't know anyone running a production service that doesn't. So you're going to have multiple clusters for that reason. But you're also going to have multiple clusters for other various reasons. For example, you may have a performance requirement. You have to run your compute close to your data. So you want to have, you want to have your clusters close to your data. You might need workload isolation. So you might separate your workloads between your clusters with network isolation, compute isolation, even access isolation if you're in the room and you have to deal with compliance and auditability. Um, cost is another factor, especially when you're looking at dev and production. You don't want to set up a uh, massively large production quality dev environment. Dev environments are, uh, should be a lot cheaper. You want a lot more of them. And the product environments are generally more expensive. So you're going to have multiple clusters for that. And then lastly, your failover and redundancy. Um, there, there's going to be a point at which things fail. The, the service fails. The, environment fails, uh, the data center fails. There's always certain levels of failure. You've got to have multiple clusters for high availability. And then, of course, if you ever have a disaster, you've got to have that DR site available to you. So we all have multiple clusters, and we have to deal with the nuances and the interactions between these clusters. So if we look at beyond just the technical reasons, there's a number of business reasons. So I, I interact with a lot of customers, uh, whether it's financial, healthcare, um, automotive, you name it. And they all come at us with a number of requirements that they're trying to uphold. Um, one of the things, and many of them are here in the chart, but really trying to get a secure workload running in the cloud. And they're looking to use Kubernetes as a means to do that. And a lot of that is, how do I reduce the attack vector for their business applications? Can Kubernetes help me? How many clusters am I going to need to do that? How am I going to control access for those clusters and control access not only of, of operators accessing it, because I have to audit it, but I need to have complete control of all public traffic in and out of my cluster. How do I do that? How do I do that effectively? How do I audit all of that traffic so that I can be assured that I can not only audit my operations team and provide that information, but I can also provide it to compliance officers at the time of an audit, uh, a compliance audit? Obviously, connection back to on-premises network, that's always a, a key aspect if you're not born on the cloud. Uh, which most of the customers that we deal with are not born on the cloud. Many of them have workloads already on premises, and you want to be able to connect back to those very securely and in a controlled fashion. And then another one is just secure communication of your data, data in transit both um, between clusters, between services, and within the cluster itself, pod to pod. How am I going to ensure secure communication, encrypted communication between all my pods, between every communication, every client, every destination that I talk to. So let's take a look at a very, very basic 
view of a problem or a situation that we're looking at with a customer. So they have a situation where they must control client access into and out of the cluster, but they, they have very strict requirements. And in this requirement, they wanna have two separate clusters or a sets of clusters. So in this case, we have a DMZ cluster as well as multiple back office clusters. And these back office clusters may be on-prem, they may be out in the cloud, that, it doesn't matter, but there's multiple of these back office clusters. Now I've indicated these pools, and these pools are basically just a pool of worker nodes, VMs, bare metals, doesn't matter. But it's a set of worker nodes that have very specific use cases within this, in this environment. So I, we've got edge pools and private only pools, and you can see those across both of the clusters. Now the interesting thing about this architecture with Kubernetes is that those edge pools are the only ones that have access to a public network. The others do not. So the others have access only to a private network. And that's true of both the DMZ cluster as well as the back office clusters. You'll notice the back office clusters have no public internet access at all, right? There's no inward traffic coming into that back office cluster. And that was a key requirement of this customer, is that traffic from the public could not go into that cluster. Not only that, public internet facing traffic cannot emanate from that cl those clusters either. They all have to be controlled through the DMZ cluster. So that's, this is the reference architecture that we set up. Um, and we're gonna go back through this as we go through this talk and reference that again as you start looking at the various multi-cluster, multi-cluster um, service mesh patterns. But I also wanted to call out a notion I, I said at the beginning, those back office clusters could be on-prem, they could be out in the cloud. And in IBM Cloud with our Kubernetes service, we have the ability to create private clusters. And in the case that we're working with the customer, they're going straight to the public cloud. They want to be very strategic, forward-looking, and they want to try to solve these problems in the public cloud. And one of the key um, technologies is we're going to be leveraging the notion of these private clusters that are available to us. And the private cluster basically has a set of worker nodes like we showed before that only have a uh, private network access but also the master, which is fully managed in this case, but that master also does not have public-facing internet access, which means you can't access the master or the workers through the public internet. You have to go through another channel um, to get access to them. So how many people here have heard of Istio? Istio, awesome. Okay, a fair number of you. Okay. Uh, uh, like I said at the beginning, we work on the Istio project, the service mesh. When you start introducing um, cloud, Kubernetes, and especially all the requirements that I mentioned earlier, you have to start looking at beyond just Kubernetes. It was even stated at the beginning, Dan indicated at the beginning of the, the talk in the keynote that for cloud native, it goes well beyond just Kubernetes. And we're at that point now. You're, you need additional tools. You need additional capabilities beyond Kubernetes. And Kubernetes provides a lot of value at the platform, including both the networking and network isolation security, but there's things that it cannot do, and it doesn't do today. And that's where Istio and the service mesh comes in. And Istio provides, basically, for me, I view Istio as a programmable network, is fundamentally the way I see it. Uh, with these key value propositions uh, associated with it. First of all, the ability to connect your services um, in a very efficient and flexible manner. If everybody's used Kubernetes in here, that's why we're all here. Load balancing in Kubernetes is round robin and that's it. You roll out a new version, you do a rolling update. You really don't have much control over how that rolling update and that load balancing takes place. With Istio, um, you can do the connection and better load balancing options with multiple versions of a service and you can do canary and A-B testing because you have greater flexibility of routing between your services. Istio is secure, so built into Istio is the ability to do mutual TLS. We said at the beginning, one of the customer requirements is to have end-to-end -end secure communication between your pods and between all services, both inside and outside your cluster. Istio is definitely one of those technologies that you have to look at in order to achieve that goal, because it provides out of the box secure mutual TLS communication between your pods 
as well as services outside your cluster. That it can all be, and again, it's programmed into the network, not in your application. The observability, once you have one cluster and multiple clusters, two, three, 10, 20, 100, it becomes very difficult to understand what's going on across those clusters. You need a way to be able to observe and have visibility of the resources in those clusters and the communication between those resources. And Istio with the service mesh built into the networking provides that level of observability. And lastly, uh, control and policy enforcement. Again, going back to core business requirements, you have a number of policy enforcements that must be made during the communication flow within your mesh. And you're going to want to be able to control that not only within individual clusters, but you're going to want to be able to program that across clusters as well, services that exist in multiple clusters in your production deployments. So these are key capabilities that Istio provides. And now what we're going to do, I'm going to switch it over to Rom, and he's going to take you through uh, the reference architecture for Istio, and the, as well as the three key patterns that we see for multi-mesh. Great. <laughs> Okay, so this is the Istio architecture diagram that probably many of you have seen. Um, for those that need a quick refresher, um, let me just kind of walk through this a little bit and talk about some of the high-level components. First, imagine you know, most of this is not there and you just have those two services at the top and you don't have Istio. When service A wants to talk to service B, um, service A will just do a, like a kubeDNS lookup, get the cluster IP address, start talking to it, which will then forward to the, to the pod IPs. Now, if you want um, more visibility and insights into what exactly happened with this communication, you don't quite get that out of the box with Kubernetes. You don't know if A is really A that's talking to B, um, and, and B doesn't know who exactly is talking to it. So you don't have that. You're not able to authenticate ex who is talking to who, and you don't have that control and prevent like man-in-the-middle attacks, for example. So the way Istio works is it injects Envoy proxies inside the pod running alongside your container. So inside a pod now you have, if you only had one container before, now you have two containers. Okay? And um, the component that the, the pieces at the top is called the Istio, like the, the data plane, and then all the stuff on the bottom is the control plane. So to control all of these Envoy proxies, um, where you apply your Istio configuration just through YAML, and the Istio galley component will receive that YAML, do config validation, send it over to Istio pilot, and Istio pilot will take that, translate it, and send that config to each one of the necessary um, envoys. So what this gives you now is that once A wants to talk to B, it's still no changes in your application. It still tr talks to B um, using just the DNS. Um, and then the DNS lookup happens. And in this case, uh, Istio is configured to basically replace that cluster IP addresses, and it will direct to the pod IP of, of service B. So there's this proxy going on on both sides. So this allows you to do things like um, routing-based decisions, you know, have checks to see if this communication is allowed. And after this communication happens, if, if all the policies pass and it's able to do this communication, it will then do an out-of-band uh, communication back to the Istio mixer component to, to tell it what exactly happened. So that's what gives you that, that telemetry type of information um, about the service. Now, the most important feature that, that I talk to customers about when they're adopting Istio is not this like weight-based routing, canary deployments, uh, and things like that, but it's more the, the mutual TLS aspects of it. They want encryption from pod to pod. And to do that inside your microservice, to handle the encryption, to do the certificate management yourself, adds a lot of operational overhead to your microservices and your cluster management. Istio does that for you. So it's a certificate authority. It's able to generate certificates and roll it out to each one of the, the envoys so that the, so the communication is now um, upgraded and encrypted and it happens kind of seamlessly out of the box. Okay, so that's kind of the Istio um, architecture flow. Uh, the one last piece is that little sidecar injector on the bottom. Um, this proxy injection, you can either do it manually with like, when you do kubectl apply, you can wrap it with the Istio inject, which will put that container config in next to your, your container config, or you can use the sidecar injector, which will do it for you automatically. Don't forget about the gateways. 
Yeah, well, we'll definitely cover the, the gateways in more detail. But from this diagram, it's control, controlling traffic that's coming into your network. And you can also control traffic that's going out of the network. So this allows you not only control, but also telemetry type of information. So you have more kind of restriction on that. Um, so that's Istio. And up until Istio 1.0, uh, I think the main focus has been on single cluster you know, single mesh type of pattern. And as the community starts adopting this more, um, we're now starting to tackle more complex scenarios. And, and not really that complex, because most of our customers are using multiple clusters. So the next logical question after you adopt cluster Istio for one cluster is going to be, how do I adopt this for multiple clusters? And there's kind of three main patterns um, for, for how you would do Istio with multi with multi clusters and kind of walk you through um, each one of them. So this pattern is kind of the flat network, single network, single control plane flow, um, where the cluster on the left is your your main cluster and has the entire Istio control plane um, installed onto it. And sometimes this cluster is called the local cluster in the docs. Um, cluster two are all your remote clusters, and in this cluster there are no. Uh, it's not a full-blown Istio install. It's just the required pieces. So in this case, it's just Citadel and maybe also your sidecar injector. So when you deploy applications to it, you get that Istio, um, that Envoy sidecar next to it. And to set this up, um, there needs to be some config sharing that needs to go uh, between the two. For example, um, cluster one needs a secret to have access to the Kube API of all your remote clusters. And that's because the, um, there's only one pilot. And, it, and the Istio control plane needs to know about all the different services that exist in all the other clusters. Uh, and it does that by talking directly to the Kube API and then querying for the services. The second big, um, actually, the first big requirement for this, this setup is that is that shared network, and, and that means that the the, the pod uh, IP ranges, the pod IP IP ranges, and the cluster IP ranges, um, they cannot overlap. And not only can they not overlap, they need to be able to route from one another. And that's because traffic is being routed directly from um, one cluster to another cluster without gateways of any kind. It's going direct communication. Yeah, it's going, going back to the previous picture, those Envoy sidecars that do the client-side load balancing, because of the, the flat network here, they can go directly between the clusters and access the pods um, directly. So let's, if you've walked through a flow, let's say pod foo running in cluster one wants to talk to pod bar in cluster two. Um, again, it will just do a DNS lookup for bar. Um, Kubernetes will resolve it to a cluster IP. And in this case, Envoy will basically intercept that cluster IP to the pod IP of, of where it knows that bar is running. So in this case, it knows bar is running in cluster two. We'll get the pod IP, come back, and then we'll configure Envoy to direct that traffic directly to, to pod IP. So that's kind of how that works. Um, it's pretty straightforward to use, but to actually set this up does require more, more of a complex setup. And there's a lot of moving pieces, especially because if you think about things like telemetry, um, this the Envoy on bar side now needs to talk to back to the pilot on cluster one. So there's a lot of communication going on back and forth between the clusters. So if your IPs are changing or, or, um, or you know, your secrets for your Kube API change, uh, there needs to be this like management plane to, uh, to, to handle this. So this is a good setup if you have a CI CD environment where you're able to deploy these consistent namespaces across the two, ensure similar config is being pushed out. Um, and the advantages of this scenario um, is, well, first of all, the requirement if you do have a flat network. Um, so the disadvantage of that would be, well, if you, it's not really good for isolation. If you want network isolation between your two clusters, well, this is not, this is not going to work because all they, this is just basically one big cluster. Um, the, I, I talked about the disadvantage of going back and forth, so it's kind of be chatty. So it's pretty good if you want to have um, failover scenarios where you have multiple clusters living closely together. Anything I missed? No, I mean, that, that, the, the key thing there as well is the point that you just raised right at the end that I was going to mention is um, you need to have low latency between these two clusters. So these clusters, for this pattern, those clusters better be close together. Yep. So this next flat pattern does not require a flat network. So by default, if you create two clusters on IBM Cloud Kubernetes service, they're going to be on, on separate 
networks. They're not going to be routable within one cluster to another cluster. So with that as a baseline, um, again, the installation of both is, is similar in that your, your main cluster has the full-blown Istio. Your remote clusters do not. Um, they have separate internal IP ranges. And uh, a couple of new pieces uh, involved here to make this routing happen. All services that are in the remote clusters are now associated behind an ingress gateway, an Istio ingress gateway. And all of these ingress gateways across all your clusters are labeled, and that label basically represents each of that cluster. So your main cluster now, when it wants to route to a, a pod inside of a different cluster, it will just route to the gateway of that remote cluster and have that gateway do the forwarding then inside that cluster. A um, few key technologies to outline here. Um, Pilot uses this new feature in uh, Envoy API, uh, Split Horizon EDS. So basically, that means that it's able to configure the routes based on who's calling it. So if um, Foo on cluster one is trying to talk to a service that's local, then it's just going to resolve, it, it, it's going to resolve to a local IP address. And if it's trying to talk to a service in a remote cluster in this case, then it's going to resolve to the Istio gateway address. So in this case, the, the flow would be Fo, Foo talks to, Foo resolves the IP to a cluster IP. Istio replaces that cluster IP and forwards it to the ingress gateway. Um, this communication is, is obviously um, encrypted. Um, there's a piece of uh, SNI information that the ingress gateway is able to read and figure out where it needs to route inside of it. So it maintains that encryption. And then the, and then the communication is, follows the rest of the path and goes to bar. Um, again, in this scenario, it, it's, it's a very chatty scenario with, with a little bit, of, little bit of a complex setup, and I think does need a CI/CD. Um, it's good for failover scenarios, but um, not the greatest for isolation. I mean, the other thing to keep in mind: pattern one and pattern two all have a single, basically, a single control plane. So that's a, a characteristic of both patterns: is that they have that single control plane. And the the main difference is one has a flat network. Two does not assume a flat network. Yeah, and that's actually an advantage for some folks that want um, that single control plane so you can enforce all of your Istio config to one cluster, and, and that one cluster is able to then propagate to the rest of them, right? So that sim single control plane for con configuration management as well as dashboards. So Istio comes with like Kiali, Grafana, and Prometheus dashboards, right? So in this case, you just have that one dashboard, and you're able to see your traffic flow and telemetry information across all of your clusters. Uh, the third pattern um, is multiple control planes multiple networks. So I, essentially, these are completely independent clusters. And every cluster has full-blown Istio running on it. Um, and not much is needed when you're doing the install of this installation. Uh, there's no um, like config sharing. The cluster one does not need access to the API of cluster two, et cetera. So it's simpler to set up. Um, OK, so let's talk about how, how uh, this flow, how this pattern implements this similar flow. Um, in this case, uh, Istio will configure the DNS of cluster one and adds additional um, like endpoint lookups. So by default, you know, when, 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 it asks, when Foo asks for, to resolve boot, uh, bar, it resolves to like bar, it'll search for bar, bar dot service.cluster.local, bar.default, et cetera. So it's got a few things that will look up. Um, Istio will add another entry to that, um, bar.namespace.global. So this tells Istio that you know, when it does resolve to this bar.global, that's when it needs to come in there and then replace it with the ingress gateway of the remote service. So in this case, you need to create a service entry object for your cluster one. And service entry is a way, uh, it's Istio terminology to add additional um, uh, DNS entries or, or additional like uh, service registry entry, entries into, it, into its lookup. So it adds another one for called bar.namespace.global. In this case, bar.bookinfo.global. So, and then it will, the same way as before, it will route it to the ingress gateway on the remote cluster. Um, and again, using um, uh, SNI lookup, it's able to then continue on with the flow. Uh, the advantages of this is that, like I said, it's simpler to set up. Um, 
it provides independence to each one of your applications, so each one of your clusters. So this cluster might be controlled by one specific dev team, and you might want to pick and choose exactly when you want to expose a particular service to, to other clusters. And when you decide you don't want to do that anymore, you can just stop it. And you only have that one single service entry, basically, to delete. And then you, you break the connection between the two. Uh, this is great for like Canary releases across. If you have your production cluster, you don't want to mess with it, and you have your production two or staging cluster and you want to route 1% of traffic just to this one service, um, you can do that this way. Uh, while so, And this, this can happen even with your microservices that are behind, not externally facing microservices. So the other thing that's uh, really nice about this pattern, besides some of the um, simplicities, is it has the two control planes. So every cluster has its own control plane. So it naturally will scale better than the previous solutions, right? Because um, you're basically sharding the control plane. Every, every cluster gets its own control plane, and we're basically federating the communication between them. You do need a, a common root CA, so you can do mutual TLS between them, and you can still program all that. Um, but this provides that level of, of isolation that's required in multiple uh, scenarios, but also better scale. Now. The downside, obviously, is that there's multiple control planes. And you'd have to manage multiple control planes versus one. So there is a higher operational cost for managing the control planes themselves. OK. So let's go back to our, our customer requirement scenario and see how we would do that with, with this pattern. We're going to implement this using the pattern three, the multiple con control planes. So first, you have the same DMZ and back office cluster, and you create these two edge poles. And I'm going to try to see if I can show you this. Uh, I'm running off of this hotspot because the network was really bad. Um, so let's see if this loads. And OK, so there's my DMZ cluster. You didn't switch screens. Oh. Mm. Yeah, you have to kill that. There you go. OK. You guys get no, anim no animations. Jeez. I'm just going to mirror displays one second. OK, how's that? Cool. All right, so this is the, um, here's my list of clusters. I'll choose the DMZ cluster. Make it bigger. It's not a small room. Can you guys see that in the back? Good. Awesome. OK. Really big. Jeez. OK, not sorry. <laughs> OK, so here are the worker nodes. Here are all the list of worker nodes that that I've created. And IKS has this concept of a worker pool where you can kind of group them together. So we have three of the worker nodes grouped in edge pool and then the other one's in private only. Um, and then going back to my slide, um, does this still work? And then you create your ingress and egress gateways appropriately. So the, the edge pool will have its own set of ingress and egress. and then. The, the private only pool will have its own ingress and egress. And this is needed for you know, communication. Basically, you're hopping between the public VLAN and the private VLAN. So I'm just going to skip the animation here for the sake of time and kind of jump forward. In this case, let's say I have finance as a back-end application deployed in the back office cluster. And what I want to do is I want to expose this to you know, outbound traffic. Okay. Um, I can't access this directly to the back office cluster. The first thing I'll do is I'll create an, uh, an NLB, right? So that I get a host name for this service. Um, sorry, I can't jump back and forth between this to do this demo, but I'm going to try my best. So here I have the finance application deployed in cluster two. OK, you see the finance deployment. And then, um, as normal, you create a service. And then I have a NLB, which I have it wired up to the Istio Ingress Gateway. So this Istio Ingress Gateway over here maps to oh, this external IP. 
And that external IP is the IP of this ingress gateway, this one this box right here. OK. And then the next thing we need to do is be able to forward that traffic to the egress gateway and then onto the ingress gateway of the back office cluster. So to do that, um, we just use a service entry. And while, while he's going through that, that egress gateway on the first cluster, that's optional. It, it wasn't absolutely necessary, but in this customer scenario, they wanted, the, they wanted to keep that nice pattern of inbound is ingress gateway, outbound egress gateway for every cluster. So they wanted to control both inbound, outbound, even for east-west traffic. So that's the reason why we have included it here. Mm -hmm. And we're going to use that to talk to out outbound traffic. So in this case, like, so I'm still trying to get to that finance service. So I define that finance.namespace.global entry, which will then point to the egress gateway. OK? And then that's how that communication happens. So now if I want to connect to the service, I just uh, find my NLB address. And then go to that. And then that points to my fancy finance application that's running in cluster two. So now cluster two wants to be able to talk to an external service. So let's say, but we want to control that, right? We don't want our containers to be able to talk to any outbound traffic. And this was one of the requirements of, of this customer. So if I, if I wanted to ping Google, for example, uh, if I hit that, it should, it should not allow that traffic. So you know, I'm hitting submit, and nothing's happening. Um, I should get a, an error, but I think it's just eventually going to time out. Um, Got to love demos like that where it's, <laughs> it works either it way. It works right? great, yeah. But we, what we do want to do is want to talk to, like, a, let's say, this HTTP bin status endpoint. Okay? So now if I send a request to that, please work. OK. So it's able to talk to this endpoint. So this is, going back to our slides, this is the finance service being able to talk to external traffic. And to route this, you know, we have to go through this whole flow again. Um, first, you, know, you create a service entry for the finance object. Um, and then you have it forwarded to using a Istio virtual service to the Istio egress gateway. And then Istio egress gateway will talk to the private pool and the cluster one. And then you create a regular service entry object, as you would with Istio, to allow outbound traffic. And I can show you that, but you know, it's just basically um, a bunch of YAMLs. But you get the point. Um, to, so to kind of wrap up here, um, I would say that the, the multi-cluster patterns are they're definitely not like production ready. Um, there's a lot of like kinks that need to be ironed out, and this was more meant to be uh, a, a good POC to kind of give you an idea of where uh, the Istio community is headed, what they're we're focused on. Um, especially uh, our IBM uh, research team has this has been one of their main interests. So we've documented the three patterns that I just talked about um, in more detail. Um, the author of this blog is actually sitting in this room right here, Itai. And then um, this demo, I didn't set it up myself. Uh, another member on our team, uh, Vadim, uh, you know, helped me set this up. Um, but these guys documented this in much more detail in this blog post. If you just Google Istio multi-cluster cluster patterns, you'll see a summary of this. Um, we also created a, a questionnaire for the community, uh, the Istio users community, because we're trying to learn exactly which one of these patterns um, applies to your scenario. So in this case, this multi-cluster pattern applied well to this finance banking scenario, but um, you know it might be different yeah. for And your feedback guys. is important for us, because that'll help us identify where to invest, which pattern do we want to put more development in focus on and harden as part of the Istio project itself. We may do all three. We may decide to do one or just two of them, depending on how the feedback that we get from the community. So we, we definitely do need your feedback. So definitely take a look at the, the patterns there. Um, take a look at the questionnaire. Hit us up on the community site. Leave your feedback. So that will help us um, better prioritize our work. Cool. With that, I can say thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. And I forgot to remind everyone that you're supposed to go to the Sketch Reviews yes. site to do the reviews. Um, and we did blow it. So we finished right on time, but we left no time for questions. So we will be here afterwards. So if you want to come up and ask us questions, that's fine too. Cool.